This is the Brain Software Podcast, episode 205, originating from Toronto, Canada. I'm Chris Thompson, and today, Mike Mandel is on the Stratocaster. Uh, he and I are going to discuss the intersection of hypnosis and belief. So stay tuned. Yes. Disclaimer. This is an important warning for you. If in the Costa Brava, it's your own fault. Lucci. Hey, what's happening, Breach Clout? It's Dave Ambrose, man, people's physicist. So how about that whole wave particle duality pouch? Weird stuff, Scroll, but I digress. Someone sent me an email for me and asked what I thought. If it was true that the Bohr model of the atom where the electrons zip around in discrete orbits is accurate and it's a real good version of reality. Here's my answer, Zach. First of all, what is reality, man? That's the spirit of the 60s. Secondly, it's a stupid model just because Niels Bohr is a dick. So we can just discount anything he said, Scroll. So keep sending in your physics questions. I'll give you the real answers, man. Answers you can put in your croaker sack, scroll. But I have to wonder, whatever happened to that old tranquility we used to know? Ah, uh, ha, 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 ha. Uh, these, these are, are days of victory. So let's welcome to the hypnotic croaker sack, the hypnotic answer to the question, who cares? A man who's found that as he's getting older, he's quoting the juice man a lot more frequently. And the Keith Richards of hypnosis. Let's leave that one out. Mike Mandel. Everybody. Yes, Chris. Again, I came across with the arms. It was really nice. I didn't oh, slide down man. the chair awkwardly and do myself a disservice. Though. Okay, this is, we're going to have a great podcast. This is going to be very oh, content be rich with all the stupidity, content of course, free. always attached. No, we said we're going to do a neat podcast on. We were, so Mike and I had this conversation about beliefs and hypnosis yes. and how are beliefs and hypnosis exactly how are they interconnected and we're making the or the are they? gesture they, yeah and they definitely are and i think this will underscore the idea that hypnosis is freaking everywhere unfortunately really. and fortunately he's yes correct um but before we dive into it let's start with our think tank words these are words actually drawn from the salvo book of check think tank in my office mm -hmm. three random words that we then use the pattern matching of the human brain our brain to see how they fit, to into, see the how they the fit into the rest of the context mm. in fact we cause them to fit whether or not they actually do and that's how the brain works so okay i'm cheating gonna start I'm, with, I'm gonna give you the first one all right impoverish impoverish oh the penury of it all, Chris. The penury. <laughs> what does that? What does that I'll give you? I'll give you the next one. It's let's go through all three. Establishment, okay. establishment, that. and pommel. Pommel, not rommel, the African pommel, corner. like pommel. pommel horse, as in gymnastics. Pommel, yeah. I thought pommel. that would have had one M in it, but so let's start hmm. with impoverished. Hmm. What do you get from that? Well, that this podcast will probably be impoverished of in any content <laughs> if we stay on this line too long. Okay, we don't want to wind up in so, penury. So impoverished is to to reduce the. The wealth of something or yes, to, to weaken, a, maybe. To bring it to a state mm -hmm. of penury. It's <laughs> such a great word. Penury. I don't even know that word. Penury. No, penury don't know. It's poorness, poverty. No. Yeah. 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 Okay. So we, how would that apply? We want to make sure we're delivering stellar mm -hmm. content. So even this is podcast 205 that we continue giving things that actually work in the real world. That's whatever right. That is. We want to do the opposite of impoverished. Okay. Right. Establishment. Counter impoverishment. Establishment. No, the establishment is something that we're not really part of. Yeah. We've got this little company that's a little buccaneer pirate ship with a, you know, a, a dog that jumps in Ollie and occasionally decrotches us when we're doing this, but we have, I have no idea where I'm going with this. Well, Chris. I'll tell you where you're going with this. We are not part of the rigid <laughs> things that don't change. Always do things the same way. He's never right, learn. Damn him. Get get stuck in your ways yeah. and then be hypnotically influenced by Cialdini's principle of commitment and consistency. We oh. cannot change because we said it this one way yeah. before. I just wish I hadn't said mm. stuck in. That's yeah. an English phrase my dad stuck would always in. use when he had a horrible task for me to do. Come on, lad, get stuck in. It's like, uh oh, uh, stuck in like, like, to, like dig your boots yeah, it feels in like and, a, and do a life work. sentence. Yeah. Okay. And the next pommel one is pommel? pommel. A pommel. I think that's the thing on a, a saddle that you tie the rope around. But is that what it I is? I think, it, well, that's yeah. what we, is, I don't know. Okay, well, we're going to skip, we're, we're gonna skip that one. No, we're not. No, no. We cannot skip it. Right. So my question is, Chris, what is the pommel, metaphorically speaking, that you're 
tying your own personal rope around. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah. What are what are you using to And the to answer to that could probably yourself. send you to prison. <laughs> that's okay, just so let's get out of here. All right. So, so let's get into the real con. Actually, before we even go uh, into the whole beliefs and thing, let's yeah. start off with what I was just telling you this morning about <sighs> hypnosis is everywhere. It is. So earlier Damn it, it's right there. About a week ago, I got mm. a mild Achilles tendon injury playing baseball, and it hurt. So the yeah. next day, I took some time off my workout, and I eventually got back on the Peloton bike, and I was doing a workout. But I had decided that I'm going to stay, what they say, in, in the saddle. There's my pommel. There it is. I'm going to stay in the in spinning world, they call it. If you're sitting down on the bike, you're in the saddle. And if you get out of the saddle, you're you're sort of jogging or climbing out a hill, whatever. Or doing something, yeah. I decided I'm not, I'm going to stay in because I don't want to hurt my, I don't want to hurt my Achilles tendon yeah. anymore. And here's what happened. About five minutes into the workout, mm-hmm. I suddenly catch myself standing up and I'm riding out of the saddle, holding on to the pommel. The yeah. And I realized, why, why did I do that? Well, the girl teaching the class had just said, everyone, you know, get up out of the saddle and pedal at a certain RPM or whatever it was. So I thought, why did I just unconsciously and automatically respond to that suggestion? Did she hypnotize me? That's, well, that's very hmm. interesting. And, it, and here's the thing. What I figured out is a few things happened in advance. So first of all, She's a great trainer and she's my favorite trainer. I call her my girlfriend. I say, I'm going down to have a, a workout. I'm going to yeah. gonna train Stop with my girlfriend. It these days. Anyway, <laughs> no, wait a minute. No, awesome. wait, is she amazing looking too? Yeah. I her, suspected that uh, was the It's on was Peloton. It's Emma Lovewell, in case anyone's a Peloton you fan. You've said her there. name. Yeah, Hoping that's her name. she'll be Googling herself. Oh, there you go. And she'll she'll oh, this podcast so mentioned me. I should she's, contact uh, this guy, Chris. Great trainer. And she, I, so obviously prestige and authority. She's an amazing trainer. She sounds gifted. And I had been following a compliance set. Of course, because, well, dial the certain resistance, right. pedal at this certain RPM, do this, whatever the case may be. There was all these compliance actions that happened. So then what do you think happens? Even though I've said in my head, I'm not standing up, I'm not You're getting following your compliance set. Automatically, she says, oh, get up. I'm up. And then I go, oh, that's not comfortable. I'm sitting back down again. I caught myself and I sat back down. Well, good thing she didn't say, you know, go and stab someone. But that is an interesting demonstration of how hypnosis is everywhere. If you get people into compliance sets and you have rapport, and in my mind, I had rapport with the idea of of working out to this class and it was wonderful. And then here I am doing something that I'd said I wasn't going to do. So based on what you're saying, and that's a very Mm -hmm. good example, Chris, how the compliance set Mm -hmm. was happening naturally. You were drawn into the experience for (laughs) numerous reasons. Anyway, uh, having said all that, I guess the bottom line is, well, we say hypnosis is everywhere, but Chris and I don't mean, you know, so the idiots don't write it. Nobody puts you in a trance. It's not. It's shut up. It's happening all the time. We're talking, when you're, things yeah. can be hypnotic without being formal hypnosis. Exactly. Uh, every, all the experts, other experts would agree with me. So there. All right. So now that has really nothing to so do with beliefs. So what are beliefs though? What are beliefs? Okay. So we're back beliefs, to beliefs. Again. Yeah. We've so we've, we've done podcasts on this before. And we've <gasps> said that we a have. belief is something that we hold to be true. Correct. Right. So now we have to ask ourselves how do beliefs and hypnosis fit into, fit into life and how do they fit together? Well, how do people even form beliefs, right? Well, authority figures tell them certain right. information. Information is repeated. Maybe they see it and they form their own conclusion. And once you hold that to be true, remember I said to you, belief is almost like an anchor of some sort. So you are you even aware of your beliefs most of the time? Let's maybe start there. Probably not. And mm-hmm. our behavior is run largely by unconscious beliefs. Notice mm-hmm. I'm switching into my teaching state, yeah. which is essentially devoid of all the stupidity. Although I will do this again. Okay. <laughs> now, so yeah, beliefs will be the foundation of our worldview. Mm-hmm. Our worldview is propped up by beliefs. The worldview being the bigger chunk, right? Mm-hmm. I see you looking ahead in my notes, just trying to figure where you're going next. No, no, no. Try no. to stay with this. I'm making sure I don't hey, deviate ADP too much. Boy, yeah. Over here. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Hi. So beliefs are, are part of our worldview, but as, as Chris is saying, are they going, <laughs> idiot, are they going to be um, something we're, we're necessarily conscious of? And definitely I don't, not. I don't we think that we to are. Yes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, um, I'll give an example. Let's say I believe that oysters are disgusting. I don't. I used to, but you, we talked about oysters because right. you went out for oysters for lunch yesterday. I did. Uh, if I believe that oysters are disgusting, and they're not, I'm not going to be thinking about that very often at <laughs> yeah. all. Like ninety nine point nine percent of the time, the yeah, they, 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 they I believe that oysters are made gross. you say, "How about those damn oysters?" Right. I'm not That's thinking disgusting. about it. But yeah. if I 
knew that someone else believed that and I wanted to dial up some sort of emotion, I could now start talking about yeah. it and tie into that belief and leverage it for some sort of call it hypnotic effect. I could manufacture an emotion in another yes, person in a yes. certain way, right? Whereas I don't know what would be another example. Let's say I believe that fitness is really important and eating well is well, really important. Well then that important. is going to drive your behavior. That's going to drive my yeah. behavior unconsciously most of the time whereas i'm not unconsciously avoiding oysters most of the time i'm just <laughs> it's just absent from my life some right? people consciously avoid them whereas yeah. unconsciously i may choose certain meals or do certain things with my body working out i'll just automatically be like oh yeah of course i'm going to work out today but i'm not consciously thinking about it I just, right. it's just part of my life it's an unconscious belief most of the time but it can become conscious it's just always right. there. It can be slip into conscious mm -hmm. awareness, but it is just lurking in the background. Lurking, lurking in, in the, the lurkery. lurkery. Yes. Yeah, like Jack the frickin' yes. lurker. Mm -hmm. And then it pops into your awareness. Now, the thing is, we, we said beliefs can be accurate or wildly yeah. inaccurate. They can be right? accurate. They can be false. They can be somewhat true. Yeah, it, they can be empowering or they can be limiting. That's right. They and, can and be that's really, you know, limiting, right. Our beliefs are going to formulate how we interact with other mm -hmm. human beings. If I have a belief that a certain race, and let's say we'll call them Martians, that we're not offended Those by Those darn Martians. Those darn Martians, they're all thieves. Martians are thieves. You know, they're always stealing. And if I see one of these Martians it in a fun. variety store, my first thought is, what is that bastard stealing? Look at him. Mm -hmm. What is he up to? I saw him in my neighborhood. Who is he casing the places to break in? Our beliefs are then putting these perceptual filters right. over what's going on that may have no basis in reality whatsoever. Right. Okay. So See, I, I can't stand fideism. <clears throat> fideism. Fideism. It comes from philosophy. It's the idea that, well, you know, why do you act? That? Well, I just want it to be true. So it is. It's true. Be <laughs> it's true because I believe it to be true. And that that's a nonsensical way to live. Yeah. That. Yes, I would agree with that. I think that was. I don't have anything else to add. Well, to okay. That. Yeah. Now your beliefs can be wildly false. Mm -hmm. You know, you can make accusations of someone, and they might be false. Or you might believe someone's a great human being, and they're an idiot. And you know what? They can be false and empowering at I the same time. Say false time, and true right? at the same time. If I believe that I will be able to slam dunk a basketball, right? Maybe I'm wrong, but if it empowers me to keep practicing and getting stronger and doing certain things, I might make my life a lot better. Right. Even though I'll never actually get to the you goal. You won't be Michael Jordan. Yeah. Right, right. And, and if I believe that I can neck crank most people. You will walk around with it'll the be an, It'll be an accurate belief because it freaking can. <laughs> you, but if you couldn't, <laughs> no. and if you had some skills and you were able to defend yeah. yourself or yeah. it motivated Damn you it. to Bang. learn even more self-defense, and now you're walking around presenting yourself to the world as someone who isn't going to take no crap from nobody. Yeah, no mofos. Now, yeah. here's the interesting thing, though. I think looking at this seriously for only about 15 seconds. Okay. There's the whole okay. aspect of whether a belief is empowering or disempowering. Mm -hmm. I think that is the most important question here. Although if you have wildly inaccurate beliefs about your spouse or your kids or something, that would be a, a, a danger point. But I'm just saying, are those beliefs empowering or, or disempowering? Mm -hmm. And Chris and I use the NLP phrase. Somebody will say, you know, oh, my life is just going down the tubes. It's every day is getting worse and worse. And we'll typically say, and how does that belief serve you? How does that belief serve yeah. you? It's a fun question to ask. And it can be rather annoying to some people some of the time. Well, how does that belief serve me? Um, <laughs> yeah, well, like back up. Now, let, well, no, let's go forward. And no, yeah. yeah, let's back. Let's go back to going forward. Dr. Krasner, um, the Krasner system of hypnosis. We had Ryan Montes come in as a guest trainer. He was excellent. He taught this method. Uh, Krasner had some very formalized ways of doing hypnosis that were extremely mm -hmm. effective. He's no longer with us, but uh, Krasner made the point. I think his book is The Wizard Within. The Wizard Within. Yeah, yeah. still a good book. And he said that belief plus expectation, expectation. equals hypnosis. Mm. Now, isn't that a, it's not really a definition of hypnosis, but it is, it, it is largely <laughs> showing us the structure of hypnosis, isn't it? That makes a ton of sense because if we think about some different contexts where that model seems accurate let's say stage hypnosis show okay they believe they're at a stage hypnosis show they believe that they want to volunteer right they expect to be hypnotized because that's the context yes, of the situation yes. or a clinical hypnotherapy setting they believe that they have a problem they believe that hypnosis can help otherwise why the hell did they pay why money would they to bother yeah unless the state's right for it. yeah and they expect 
to be results. helped. Right. Yeah. Exactly. A so positive result. Those, those things together but will work. Here, you're right. And here's what's noteworthy in the Krasner definition. Belief plus, I've mm -hmm. underlined plus, plus, expectation equals hypnosis. You can have all the expectation in the world, but if you don't have the belief, it's mm -hmm. not going to be hypnosis. And you can have all the belief about it, but if you don't expect that this person is going to be able to run a process that's going to help you, yeah. you probably wouldn't be going there. Well, let me ask you a quick question on all this. Right, how, how would one expect something without believing it? Can you think I of an example? Yeah, I know. I can't think of one off the top of my head right well, now. Well, I'm just, I'm saying there, there may be aspects of doubt there. Yeah, I hope it works. I, I guess it's, yeah, you know yeah. what I'm saying? You know yeah. what I'm saying? I, I suppose uh, the you know belief would be the first step. The, you'd have to believe that something can happen or will happen and then expect it. I think yeah. the expectation has to follow. I'm just thinking something stupid. Like if I blow up a balloon and I hold it there. You're right. It is stupid. If I let go of that balloon, I expect it to. What color know, balloon is I, it? A white balloon. It's a white <laughs> balloon. It's a little white balloon. It Mike. flew to the moon. And now he's dead. Because it, it flooded his, his, his bed. bed. Okay, All right. That's a good point. But that now, makes sense, right? I expect it yeah, a certain because result. I believe that the increased pressure in the balloon yes. will result in air velocity, which will create thrust and <laughs> Pressure, of course, there being go. equal in all directions. That's and right. Well, oil. most, yeah, mostly. As long mostly, as yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, like, well, Marky de Pisagur, he made that interesting comment. He was doing a lecture on hypnosis as mesmerism had turned mm -hmm. into hypnosis, was in that, you know, that blurry middle zone for a while. Uh, Charcot, the dick, went and tried to do mesmerism again. He tried to revive it for a while. And remember, Charcot, I, I always suspect him because he only worked with young female patients, which shows me there's something a little it's shady a little bit, about Charcot. Mm, little yeah. bit, mm. I'm not saying I'd want to fight him in the octagon if he was here, although I could. and it, It'd be very, very simple. Um, let's just go back to Marquis de Pisagur because I okay. seem to have digressed and got yes, to the octagon. Yes, so what were you but, talking about? Well, he did a demonstration on hypnosis for the um, Parisian Freemasons. And they saw it as all very mystical and so on. And, and that was very much in the, the zeitgeist at the time. And he said, they, they said, why is it that you, Marquis, can do that you can hypnotize pretty well anyone? And he said, I make a vivid internal picture in my mind of the result I want. And then I believe that that picture is true. And then I act upon it or words to that effect. He spoke in French. So that's interesting, isn't it? You're, it, you're it getting ties in massive belief and congruence working together. The old uh, Maxwell Maltz psycho cybernetics oh, the 70s, and the yeah. idea yeah. that if you vividly imagine something and believe it to be true, yeah. that you will increase your performance. And, you know, there's just simple things like imagining that you're playing a sports game and you're playing it flawlessly. You're not actually doing it, but you're imagining it so vividly. Yeah. yeah. And then your performance increases somehow. Yeah, mental practice mm -hmm. is, is de rigueur now. Maxwell Maltz in the early 70s when he came out with this stuff. I think Matt Fury now. Matt Fury took the, over it. Yeah, yeah, he owns yeah, the And actually on Trittle. Audible, the book is is uh, narrated by Matt Fury. No, that's good. He's probably yeah. good for it. it. You know, and the things we do with the, the valves and the wrists and that. And yeah. the body sinking and the body made of concrete blocks. Mm -hmm. And that, what was the final one? Do you want to explain that for yeah, a moment? We, we had these metaphors when you're doing self-hypnosis and to go into a deep, relaxed state. Not that you need that. Take uh, a deep Valves in. in the hands or feet or whatever, they're and released and you're deflating and sinking down into the bed. Or you're made of concrete blocks was yeah. another one. Think or about you're, when you're inflating a bicycle tire and you know just at that moment where you're trying to lock down the valve, but it goes, starts letting air out. I do not inflate bicycle tires, Chris. You do not? No. Why is it? It's is too it, much trouble. I hire someone else to do it. <laughs> but if you, I, whenever I would inflate, you know, yeah, you'd, push the little, you'd push the little thing on and lock it down. And just before you do, you panic and yeah, <laughs> starting to say, panic. Okay, bring it's me supposed to be at 40 PSI because yeah. I refuse to use, you know, the metric system on it. And just as you're setting it, yeah. Tss, yeah. And now you got Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. You can no longer tell. And, and what is the pressure? Yeah, because you no can, yeah, if you measure yeah. it, you change it. Oh, there we go. Screw okay, it. Up. Well, it's okay. So the idea being dangerous. you in, yeah, inhale and then imagine that sound. But back to as Peter Gurd, he mm -hmm. believed it and then he did the hypnosis. The and hypnosis and the belief overlap, but he's bringing in the Mandel triangle without realizing it. Oh. He's bringing in confidence. He's bringing in congruence. He brought it in before and then you he's were bringing even in intention. Born. Do you realize all three of them are there? Totally, yeah. You don't really do. You're yeah, just saying yeah, it to get uh, on to the yeah, next yeah, point. Yeah, no. Yeah, he believes it to be true. He's So he's confident about it. He's congruent about it. And he's going in with intention. We <laughs> will make sure that in the show notes, we put a link to the blog post about the Mandel Triangle. And I think we'll we have forget. a YouTube video on this as well, which just is Just remember, really we, want, we intended to do that. Yes. And if we forget, yes, we're human. That was right. But we believe that we can. Okay, so yeah. how much belief is required for a hypnotic trance. Okay, it, it we're, we're starting. We're starting with that. I'll. I will 
throw out there that I believe zero belief has to be there for a hypnotic trance. Okay, but, but I'm asking context. Yeah. Belief from whom? The hypnotist or the subject? Um, neither. Uh, you see? Oh, I'll wow. say neither because let's imagine that there is no hypnotic context whatsoever. Okay. Let's say we're just watching a hockey game. We're live, we're in the audience, we're watching. Or you're watching a, a schoolyard fight or something like that. Anything. Or you're watching a live music performance. There is no expectation set up necessarily. It's just an amazing, mesmerizing right. performance. What's going to happen? We're going to slip into a hypnotic trance. Yeah. Now, maybe I have to believe that I like this music or that I'm interested in this. I guess those are unconscious beliefs. Well, yeah, I, I have to believe yeah. that this is interesting. Which is not necessarily Which a certainly not belief. true about this podcast. But mm -hmm. the, the thing that I find intriguing about that is so again, you're describing phenomena that are largely hypnotic. Yes. Without being classical exactly. hypnosis. But I've corrected myself here because Brilliantly. you do have to believe, but not consciously. You have to believe that what's happening is interesting. Yes. Or no, you won't yes, have exactly, focus. Yes. And you can't have you can't have hypnosis without focus. Interesting. Mm, isn't that one? You see? All right. The kid's yeah. doing well. So how much belief is required for hypnotic trance? It depends. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, when you get a subject, let's say we're dealing with uh, a stage show. And I remember back in the day when I did thousands of these things, looking down in the audience and I had my four, four row rule. I could see the fourth row typically really well because I like to have the audience because the close. lights are all shining yeah. but you can see those first and four rows I would rows. see people and I would see external trance when they're doing this right yeah and they're, they're staring in the starery mm -hmm. you know sitting there staring like Jack the freaking Ripper at me and I'd know that they were good subjects and the way you're doing it right now, staring like Jack the Ripper. <laughs> Jack the victim. Ripper? No, Jack the Ripper's victim, I said, oh, like when wow. he pulls up whatever blade he used, probably a flensing scalpel. But when you think about it, because I would see these external trans indicators, I would know if those people came up, they're going to be great subjects. They're sitting the there power in full belief mm. and full expectation yeah. of hypnosis. Yeah, belief. like if you're, okay, if you saw somebody that happened to be I don't know. Let's say there is a boyfriend, girlfriend or something like that. Are and dressed and the, the girl is really not that it matters which gender is which, but one of them is, is like really interested in the other one sort of casual. Yeah. Laid back. For the audio only yeah. people, that was me being all casual. Casual, laid back. yeah. Um, you would probably not want the casual onlooker flippantly just not yeah, because really they're not going to put in the focus they're not yeah. going to give you the concentration the person who thinks they're just going to be the class clown yeah. and take over the show is about you you're well the show's about the audience but you're driving the bus you are the man controlling that show the conductor that needs musicians who will play yeah. their instruments right you know i mean that's the bottom line there yeah so we can say it it's useful to have a strong belief in hypnosis to make it work but it's, but not, it's not essential, essential. so you could you have see? somebody come up on stage and say you know I'm not really sure about this hypnosis stuff, but if they believe they're interested, that's really enough, isn't it? Yeah, I believe so. Mm, isn't believe, that interesting? Yes, I believe. Yeah. Now, again, we will run into the people who have a belief that they cannot be hypnotized. Um, is that a problem? I think as long as they have the interest, it is not a problem because you can show them. And that's what hypnotic pre-talk is often all about, right, right? right? Explaining to people that, well, hypnosis isn't what you think it is. It it's is what you, it's think, what it you is. think it is. It's happening yeah. all the time. Yeah. So when you do a pre-talk and you explain to somebody that when they're watching a scary movie and right when, you know, someone's about to be hunted down in some evil way and you as the viewer catch yourself with all your muscles tense. Yeah. Why is that? You're not in the movie. You're, you're not responding being emotionally. So you're, you're responding. Suggestion. And yeah, and what's happening is you're you're going into the film. You're experiencing it. Mm -hmm. You no longer have any any awareness of the, the rubber plant in the corner of the room and the stairwell in the background and the dog walking by. No, you're focused entirely on the locus of the focus is the screen right. and the content of the screen. And that, of course, is hypnosis. Of course it is. So you don't have to believe in hypnosis for hypnosis to work. But no. for hypnosis to work, you do have to believe that you're interested in what's going on at that moment. Correct. Now, you remember I, I did mm -hmm. a lecture at the Armed Forces College in Toronto for NATO forces. I noticed that we're, we're talking really quietly Yes, because <laughs> we have to be quiet that nobody overhears this. Oh, okay. And, okay. We did that lecture and I told them, I said, television is the most ubiquitous trans inducer in oh, the yeah. world. And they found that fascinating. It seems that nobody Do you believe that. that to be true? I believe yeah, it to be go. true. Now you get the people who say they, they believe they can't be hypnotized. 
I was at a wine event once. I was there when I was a wine writer in my spare time, just for the fun of it, as you know. I oh, yeah. a lot of free wine and stuff. and had a blast MC the wine. Free events. wine. That it sounds was, wonderful. It was wonderful. Cases yeah. of stuff arriving. And I met this guy. I'm going to. I'm going to be very gentle and I'm just going to describe him in a way so you'll understand him without me being harsh. He was a dick. <laughs> How did I know you were going to say that? He's an absolute dick. Okay. Like a and little, why was that? Sort of what, a Joe Pesci kind what, of character. What made him But a he dick? was brash and okay, he owned a, can, rest, he owned a restaurant and he had a sommelier who was this beautiful young woman who was brilliant at what she did and she was great. And I thought, why is she working for this idiot? And he said, what do you do? I said, I'm a, I'm a hypnotist. Oh, I can't be hypnotized. My mind is too strong. And, and what did you say? I said, sucks to be you. Sucks to be you. They, they, they don't, it's a misunderstanding it's about It's a hypnosis. way to shatter that belief so quickly too, right? Yeah, oh, I can't friends. be hypnotized. Like I'm doing it to you and yeah, you're not participating. You're resisting me. I believe that my mind is stronger. It's nothing to do with that. It's a psychodynamic relationship. You may as well like, be saying, I can't read. I'm just not smart enough. Yeah, or you're taking an art class and they're going to teach you to paint. And you say- I can't be forced to paint a picture. I'm not, I'm, you know, my mind, my is, mind too is too strong. strong. Is it what? You got to yeah. follow the steps, Dick. Yeah. You know? yeah. That's a really good yeah, way to stop put it. saying Dick. Yeah. You know, I'm well, not swearing much anymore, as you yeah, know, but I, I, I can't I'm that. really disappointed, but Shut up. I do accept the increased use of the word Dick. I think that's just funny. <laughs> Except um, if you don't adopt I, it. Yeah. Because Dick is also the short form for Richard. the name Richard. Yeah. I have taken to calling someone a Richard. No offense to any Richards. We have actually a lot of Richard friends. Richard Clark, Richard <laughs> uh, from Hypnothoughts Live. I have taken uh, to calling was, people but, a father. But if you, you call people. You know, call, oh, he's a father. A that father. Guy's a real father. What's make a up, father? Make up something You know random. why I call him a father? No. Mother effer. Oh, man. <laughs> is that terrible? <laughs> it's terrible. Really I've heard true. that lately, but it's that's quite, quite funny. funny. We're still, we're the still idea family of friendly. taking the he swear word, just distilling it down. Distilling the emotions around it. Yeah. By using a replacement word that's Knows one layer away. And then eventually we, we get two, three, four layers away and we start calling it a, you know, a blanket. Okay, or let's something. not continue with this because <clears> right. we have we have a special report, Chris. Uh -oh, we have uh -oh. to go there let's right go. now. Today we have a special report. Can we hear the announcement? Yes, we have a special report coming in from Dallas, Texas. And hold on to your hats, folks. This is dramatic. After a long absence, there has been another Gus Grissom sighting. This report comes in from Sheriff's Deputy Stephen Watts Jr., who is visiting Dallas with his nephew. Watts reports the following. My nephew and I were having an awesome morning. We just had a huge and typically Texas breakfast with bacon, scrambled eggs, sausages, toast, and grits, and decided to head on over to Dealey Plaza to take a look. I had always wanted to see the Texas School Book Depository and as a police officer was interested in viewing the grassy knoll and the surrounding environs. My nephew and I checked out the statue of Old Man Dealey and then walked over to the grassy knoll to take some pictures from up there. Just then we heard a motorcade approach and looked down on Elm Street. There were a number of police on motorcycles and an open limousine with a driver and a secret service agent in the front seat. In the back seat of the limousine, there was a man who was looking up at the old school book depository and staring at the windows like he was expecting something to happen. The vehicle was moving slowly, and as the man in the back glanced up in our direction to the grassy knoll, another man on Elm Street opened an umbrella and held it up over his head, which was unusual since it was a sunny day. As the man in the limousine turned towards us, I suddenly realized it was Gus Grissom, because I'd know that brush cut anywhere. The vehicle roared away and was gone in about 20 seconds. Watts went on to report that Grissom looked very fit and in a positive state of mind, but even at 100 feet he could tell that Grissom was a little tired around the eyes. He said that the umbrella man quickly fled the scene, but Watts was pretty sure it was Jack Ruby. So there you have it, Chris. The mysteries resume. Oh, I wonder what's right. next for Gus Grissom. I wonder. It's an amazing thing to have those reportings. So thank you and keep them coming. Where else are we going before we wrap up this podcast, well, Mike? I want to say, what about in the therapy room? People oh, who believe yes. in hypnosis and are excellent subjects, but don't believe they can overcome their problems. Okay, so that can be an issue, right? If somebody doesn't believe that they can actually overcome their problem, will they? 
Well, I, I look at this in a number of different ways. I think if the person has confidence in the hypnotist and in their skill level, whatever, mm -hmm. they're going to believe that the problem can be overcome, especially if they've been sent by someone who's had a great result, like mm -hmm. a family member or a friend. When I was a therapist, I, I never advertised. It was all word of mouth, but I had more clients than I could possibly see because it was doing good work. Good work. And it's good, good work. work. Good so work. here's the thing. It was just doing good work. It was here. If, but they don't believe they can overcome their problems. The beauty of it is if you're using some of the NLP protocols, if you're doing ADAC, you're associating them into powerful You're going to rewire their brain. You're going to rewire their brain. Right. I mean, you're that's gonna, what's actually happening. You're here. creating neuroplasticity, whether it, well, it's not self-directed neuroplasticity as Melissa uh, Tears right. taught us when she came to Toronto. This is, this is neuroplasticity. Exactly. Yeah. You are affecting neural pathways in the person's brain. Well, which is happening all the time. Yes. We're always getting neural pathways formed. Neural. And, neural and, and old ones getting overgrown. Pruned and, is the and term. pruned. There you go. Yeah. Um, I would imagine that beliefs, the belief around can I change mm -hmm. is something that the hypnotist needs to calibrate. If they calibrate that Good there's point. an issue, an issue, not an issue that needs a tissue, because that's just when you're sad and crying. But um Let's say that was just stupid, but I admit it. So it's okay. That's right? good. You came back to but that you, response. Like Jack, the freaking tree snake. That was quick. You can tell a story about a past client who had this same problem. If you detect, oh, maybe this person isn't super confident, doesn't yeah. totally believe. Here's what I'm going to say. This is the, the overarching thinking that I've got yeah, going on right now. we're all wondering where this is going. Yeah. I think that belief has threshold. So if you don't believe wow. something- how do you get to believe it? You've it's not the same threshold as it's got to be. There's got to be change. It's got to be me, and it's got to be now. Right, and that's what we right. always say is threshold for change. People won't change unless they believe that something has to change. It has to be them. It has to be now. Right, right. But what about a belief? There is this idea of threshold that something will click and go. Oh, it is possible. Whatever the case may be, right? Nice, yeah. And that could be something as and simple as- that's digital, as, isn't it? That's a digital shift. It's either on or it's off. Yes, it's but it has, an, but you have to get there. Scale, yeah. yeah. In fact, I think back to like high school physics class or uh -oh. something like that, where you have a, a rough surface, like a, a sanded plywood or something, and you put a block on it. Yeah. And you lift the angle up until when does it hit that threshold point where- Gravity takes over and it actually starts sliding. You're trying to determine the angle right? of the dangle. The angle of the dangle. There you go. When you get the right angle, all of a sudden that block starts sliding right. and it won't stop. It's unstoppable at that point. If you tilt it back a couple of degrees, it's not going to stop. It's going to keep that's going. That's interesting. I clearly missed that physics class. Well, yeah, it's just the difference between static friction and dynamic friction. But it's it a is. nice metaphor. But um, I think it's one of those things that when people imagine something differently, yeah. here is, and that could be from being told a story. Right. Or from a hypnotic guided imagery type experience, they will. And they go, oh, oh, it, it feels more real. It feels possible. They get some kind of evidence that this is possible. Yes. They have to imagine it or they have to hear about it or they have to experience the evidence themselves. And then the belief will change. And I think that is a digital. That's a digital switch. thing. It digitally right. pops up. And I, I'm not going to be a dick here, but I, I want to tell you, you, you brought up something that fits in neatly with this, which is Mr. Young, our physics teacher, good teacher. At Wexford Collegiate Art School, of but it didn't didn't help you much. No, it didn't help me at all. I, <laughs> zero, zero interest. It's like, why would I want to learn all this stuff when I can become a hypnotist and just have a blast hanging out with this guy? But here's the thing: he, Mr. Young, talked about beliefs and how they can um, cause sort of a. I, I guess a dursative effect in our understanding of science okay. because when we cling to our beliefs, despite oh, evidence sure. to the contrary, and the example he gave was- he Niels Bohr. And no, not that dick, <laughs> but he talked about friction. Yeah. And you were now talking about this and, mm -hmm. and Mr. Young said, you know, th there is no such thing as friction. It's just little demons that push back against your hand. So put your hand on the desk and you push. Oh, the demons are pushing demons. back. The demons are pushing back. And you say, well, we can't see them. He said, well, demons are invisible. And you say, okay, what if I put oil on the desk and now it's slippery? He said, oil drowns the demons. So said, he was so teaching about the desk, razor. Clean it all off now. And now it's slippery. He said, demons reproduce really quickly. They're back again. Uh, and it, it was just showing how, yeah, Occam's razor, the sim not, okay, it's not, what do you, what do you understand Occam's razor okay, to so, be? Because then I'll correct all you. All right. So no, I don't <laughs> think you're going to need to correct me. I think me. I That's will. That's my belief. Occam's razor is when the 
p- the solution or the idea that requires the fewest new, the explanation, maybe that's a better okay, word. Okay, go ahead. The explanation that requires the fewest new assumptions is usually you the are correct. correct. Most, uh-huh. people, most people distill it to saying Occam's razor is, and we're not talking the about- The simplest Chuck, Chuck the solution is yeah, the, the correct simplest solution. Is, no, it isn't. It's the one that requires the fewest new hypotheses. And I get why that happens, because simple usually means you need to invoke fewer new assumptions. This is it. So if we simply say friction is the result of surface roughness, okay, oil affects surface roughness directly. And all is that Is roughness kind of stuff. a physical property of friction? Is it actually a term of physics? Well, surface roughness is a description of a physical material. Yeah. yeah so, but is it yeah. a physics term? No, I wouldn't say that it is. Maybe it is. He I don't just know. got out of it, folks. I don't know. You heard that. Yeah. He got out of it. <laughs> there you go. So you've yeah. got the simplest explanation or yeah. the one that requires the, the fewest, new, fewest hypotheses. new hypotheses. Yes, Mr. That's Young. It. But we've yeah. got we've got to go to the empowering question. We're gonna do it differently today. Okay. I'm gonna do you're the empowering gonna question it. and you're gonna do the metaphor. All right, I'll give the metaphor. All right. Your empowering question for today is, what is it that you really believe about your ability to do hypnosis or to be an excellent hypnotic subject? And is it that belief helping you or hindering you in your life? That's right. Okay, so I've got the I've got a perfect metaphor here that I think will be fun and fit nicely. So when I was a kid living in Ottawa, I had a best friend who lived down the street. His name was Chris Jaguer. When I met him, I was so impressed because this guy could walk on his hands. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen anyone walk on their hands, but to me, as a I was probably like 13 or 12, this was remarkable. It was amazing. And I wanted to learn how to do this. And so I watched him, asked him a few questions. I started practicing in my backyard, practicing in the park across the street. And eventually, I too could walk on my hands. I can still do it today. But it wasn't elegant. It didn't look pretty. I, you kind of look like an upside down gorilla. The feet are flailing all over the place. There's a huge arc in your back, arch in your back, whatever the correct word is here. Mm-hmm. And But I could walk. And it's a sense of you're kind of almost about to fall over. So you take a step with your hands to stop your, yourself from falling over. And it's this weird balance. Well, it didn't look pretty. Now, Fast forward a couple of years, I'm watching the Olympics. My dad and I are sitting on the couch together and we're watching the Olympics and we were really interested in watching the gymnasts, the floor routines and things like that. And I'd see these gymnasts and they could do these amazing handstands and just stand there like a person standing on their feet, perfectly vertical, but they're upside down. They're on their hands. I thought, wow, they must have amazing balance. If I just practice my handstands and I practice my balance, maybe I too could do an amazing vertical, pure sticking handstand like that. That would be so cool. Well, I could never seem to get around to finding enough balance. No matter how hard I practiced, I could not get enough balance. I would always fall over one way or the other. A few years ago, we had a hypnosis student. His name was Yaya, and he and I got together at his hotel gym one morning, and he could do a perfect freaking handstand. I said, how did you learn to balance that perfectly? How did you do that? He said to me, Chris, it's not the balance. Balance is one little component of a handstand, but you have to have sufficient wrist strength. You have to have upper body strength in your back. You have to have sufficient shoulder mobility, and he showed me a few things, and then he said to me, Get a coach who can teach you these things. He didn't live in my neck of the woods, of course, so he wasn't going to be my coach. But if you get a coach who can teach you all of these pieces and you practice those pieces, then the balance is the final step and that will come easily. And that's exactly what I did. I ended up discovering a program called Gymnastic Bodies and I learned how to do a handstand because I learned all of the components that could fit into place. And then the balance was easy. Fantastic. And with that, we're closing. This has been the Brain Software Podcast coming at you from Toronto, Canada. Episode 205, all about hypnosis, NLP, and personal development. I'm Mike Mandel. I'm Chris Thompson. And we're just going to end because we're going to Colonel Bastards for lunch now. And if you're ever in the Port Perry, Ontario area on a Friday afternoon around noon, you look for us, us at Colonel Bastards, also known as Colonel Mustards. Thanks, Thanks again, again. And good night. night.